We're going to turn to our scripture. But I want to remind you that the thematic scripture for us throughout this current series in knowing God, the thematic scripture is this, John 17. This is life eternal that you know, you guys have to memorize this. This is life eternal that they know the only true God and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is life eternal. That you know God. For that reason, we will never tire of getting to know God. Not from this pulpit. It'll be our objective to continuously know God through His Word. Because it is through the knowledge of God that we find salvation. Today, I would like to invite you to consider with me one of the attributes of God that we often talk about. But we don't spend much time on. If we were to say the three most commonly known attributes of God, what would they be? Come on now, you all know this. God is? God is omnipresent. And second one? Omnipotent. And omniscient. You guys are all Bible scholars. I can now close the book and... Go sit down. What does it mean to be omnipotent? All powerful. All powerful. We will study that. Not this Sabbath, but another day. God is all powerful. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows everything. We will touch on that today. But we will focus on it on another day. Today, I'd like to talk about the third characteristic that you talked about, that you mentioned. Which is what? God is? Omnipresent. God is omnipresent. What does that mean? Let me hear it. God is? Everywhere. What does that mean? Everywhere. Where? 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 What do you mean by everywhere? Can you think of any place? Who can think of some place where God could not be? Maybe you could say somebody could argue that God is not there. Where is such a place? Where? Oh, somebody said hell? That's a good guess. It's possible, but the Bible tells us otherwise. Is there any place that God is not? Huh? Darkness? He says God is not in darkness? Possible. But the Bible tells us otherwise. (laughs) Now, what is the title of the sermon today? Does anybody know? Does anybody read the bulletin? What is the title? The what? The what present God? The ever present God. What does that mean? What? The word ever. The, the word ever, what does that mean? Does the word ever, is the word ever related to space? Yeah, because we said God is everywhere. The word everywhere is related to space. Am I right? Or am I wrong? I don't mind being corrected. Is the word everywhere, two words, could be one word, is the word everywhere related to space? Or not? It is. It is. Don't be nervous. <laughs> it is. What about the word ever? Is that related to space? Aha. Uh-huh. Time. Time. So when we say the ever present God, what are we saying? God is present not only in all spaces, but God is present in all You guys are so smart. 
God is present in all time. So when we say God is omnipresent, we cannot restrict that to space. We have to open our minds to understand that God is present not only in all space, but in all time. Now we're sounding like astrophysicists. We're going to discuss the space-time continuum today in church. What do you think of that, uh, Vivid? We won't really get into the depths of that. We're just going to confuse everybody, including myself. But we will touch on it. Read with me 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Now think with me. Go back in your memory, if you will. Think of the best day of your life so far. What was the best day of your life? As soon as I said that, I had one gentleman here look immediately to his wife. <laughs> and he's hoping that she thinks that the best day of her life was the day that she married him. Yeah, so she was thinking the best day of her life. I would have thought the best day of your life would have been when Vivid was born. <laughs> oh, that is also important. But think of it. What is the best day of your life? The day I was born. The day. Well, you don't. You don't, You can't remember the day you were born. That was the day that you were born. Maybe the best day of the life of your mother or father. But think about good memories. Go back. Go backward. You're really struggling. What best? Okay, never mind one. Think of two or three really good days. Never mind the best. Think of last week or think of uh, uh, a month ago, a year ago. Now let me ask you. How completely, how fully can you enjoy that time today? Can you? The way you enjoyed it at that moment, the way you enjoyed it at that time is in your memory. But can you partake of that memory as completely and as fully as you did at that time? Can you? There are many things in your life that you've forgotten. My sister in Texas, uh, I was talking to her on the phone the other day. And she said, you know, the, one of our friends from when we were in elementary school is posting pictures on Facebook. And I've taken a whole bunch of pictures of ourselves when we were kids. And there's so much that we have forgotten from when we were kids. And you can remember there are photos in your photo albums and for the newer generations on your telephones that you have forgotten. Maybe you went to Salva Beach. Maybe you went to the zoo. Maybe you went someplace on a trip, maybe camping, and you've forgotten. You cannot enjoy those things. And many of those things you've forgotten until you look at the pictures. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And you begin to enjoy the, 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 the activities around that memory. Sometimes we look at videotapes and movies. And we remember that. But that time that is past, for us it diminishes it as the only time that we can completely enjoy or completely be part of is now. This moment. That's it. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you have plans for next week for one activity or another? Let me see your hand. Everybody has some plans, right? Some, one plan or another. Maybe it's related to your work. Maybe it's related to your family. Maybe it's related to uh, uh, some, some social activity with your friends. 
but you have some plans. How much are you related to that time that is to come that are your plans for the future? Do you have any relationship with that time? Very minimal. Only in your brain, same as you do for the past. And if it's something that's really good that we're preparing, you're thinking, oh, okay, I got to think forward now. Next week, I got to sing special music. You could be like me. And in my mind, I'm preparing special music for next week. And I could say, oh boy, that's going to sound really good. But when the reality comes, it doesn't come so good. Don't laugh. <laughs> it's true. We plan for something and in our minds there's perfection. There's idealistic expectations. But when the time comes, it's not so. For God, there is no continuum of time. There is no line that starts at the old and goes to the forward to the future. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When we look at scripture and we say in the beginning, who is beginning? God's beginning? The beginning of the earth. But to God, whose knowledge is complete and his presence is complete, God is aware of and God has complete knowledge of the past and the future. In um, systematic theology, it's called tensed time. Tensed time. Past tense, present tense, and future tense. Here's where I'm going to make the connection between God's omnipresence and God's omniscience. If God is all-knowing, are you with me? If God is all-knowing and we believe that He is, and He knows the past as well as He does today, the past is no different from God than it is today. The future is no different for God as it is today. The knowledge that God had in the past and the knowledge that God has in the future is all combined in one because God is all-knowing. You understand? God is all-knowing. So there is no knowledge that is restricted or diminished by time when it comes to the knowledge of God. This is not a common thought. We're, we're delving into deep philosophy here. A biblical teaching, the, biblical theology. God is not restricted by the time continuum. There are those who respond to this teaching of tense time and say that time is tenseless. Time is tenseless. And they teach this is philosophy, this is not biblical teaching, this is philosophy. They teach that time is subjective. The time exists only in the mind of those that exist and relate to time. So, if I am alive and I'm here, time only exists because I'm here. For me, time stops to exist when I'm not here anymore, I'm dead. So for those that are living 100 years ago, that's time. And for those that are going to come and exist in 300 years, that's the time. And time is timeless. And further, that it never changes. And if you take this theory, if you take this teaching of timelessness, or tenseless time, according to them, because there is no time, whatever happens continues to happen forever, continuously. So, 
according to them, when they argue with Christians, they would say that Jesus was on the cross, and because there is no time, there is no future, there is no present, Jesus is still on the cross. And then Jesus was resurrected, so Jesus is still being resurrected. Everything continues. Now, it's kind of a fallacy. The most common accepted theory of time is the tensed time. The tensed time. Because it's common sense, it makes sense, reasonable, and it's explainable. In that, God knows your future, God knows your history. Whatever you and I have ever been, that's why, go with me, but rather than me telling you, let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, 5. So much better when we hear from the Word of God than just me. Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was born, God appointed him as a prophet to the nations. Why? Because God is not restricted by time. God knew back then, and God experienced back then, before Jeremiah was born, God was already experiencing his birth, and God was already experiencing his anointing of Jeremiah. God is not restricted by time. And why is this important to us? It's important to us because everything in our life, done 10 years ago, those pictures we were talking about, things that we forgot about, God experiences that continuously and immediately and right now. Everything in your life that has happened, everything that's going to happen in your life, God knows about it and He experiences, and He experiences it to the depth of the possible knowledge that can be had about that subject and about you. So you want to talk about your intimacy with God? Do you understand how intimately God knows us? In Matthew, he says what? Don't care for anything. Every hair on your head I know about. The birds, he says. The lilies of the field, he says. There is no knowledge that God does not have. There is no time in which there was anything that God did not know about. Go with me to John. Book of John, chapter 16, verse 30. John 16, verse 30. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you a question. This makes us believe that you came from God. Jesus had knowledge given to him by God, and he knew what? From the start, from the beginning to the end. That knowledge comes from where? God. When they were talking about when, when will the end be, Jesus said what? Nobody knows except by my Father in heaven. So, in understanding God, we have to know and understand that God has complete knowledge of tensed time. That is what makes Him God. That is what makes Him God. There is no information 
anywhere. No information anywhere. There is no knowledge anywhere that God does not know. Not only in space, but also in time. I remember when we were kids, we were told that in heaven there would be books that would record all of our activities. Did you hear that? Yeah. We grew up with that, didn't we? Yeah. And I remember thinking, boy, there'd be big books and big angels writing down all kinds of stuff. And there were, we, there were arguments and debates. How could there be that many books? you know how many books I would take to keep that much information? Today, I can type in your phone number into Google and it'll tell me where he's Thomas. You can take almost any piece of information and do what? Google it. There was a guy on uh, television the other day saying that, do you know your phones remember everything you go, where you go? He took two phones and he took out the SIM cards. And he went to several different places around Washington, D.C. And even without the SIM cards, he went back and they recorded that the telephones recorded everything, even him stepping out of a taxi cab. They knew which monument he went to, he knew which library he went to, just dro drove around. Every single thing. Where, who had it? Google had it. Without a SIM card. Now, we are only discovering technology today. I cannot even imagine, through the same principles of science, how much information God has without the need of telephone calls, uh, telephones, or without the need of Google. He has it all. He has it all. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. In understanding God, we have to come to one other discussion. In understanding God's power as being omnipresent. To understand His omnipresence, we have to discuss two ideas. Actually, one idea, but two thoughts within the idea. One, that we're told that God is unchanging. God is the same yesterday, today, and for? Ever. Ever. But we have to look at that and understand what that means. Because if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we've got to understand what that means. There are two points that we have to look at as far as change is concerned. Does God change or not change? One, there is what we call intrinsic change. Intrinsic change. The second, extrinsic change. Was that a good enough hint? <laughs> what is intrinsic change? Yeah. That's what? That's inside. Yeah. Extrinsic change is what? That's a hint. Outside, outside change. Interesting change. Using my thumb as an example, last week you noted, while I was preaching, I ended up kind of clapping my hand or something, hurt my thumb because it was all sore, it was all red, it was infected. So, did my thumb have a change in its condition, and was that change intrinsic or extrinsic? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. I had a change in my thumb, was that intrinsic or extrinsic? Ah, oh, very good. It was intrinsic in that it changed on the inside. It changed on the inside. You could see it on the outside too. But it changed on the inside. That is intrinsic change. Extrinsic change is relational. Relational. Relational how? 
My thumb is related to my fingers. While my thumb was injured, did the relationship between my thumb and my fingers change? Yes. Did it? Yes, and how did it? Normally, we pick up things with the thumb and your finger. Now, I couldn't do that. So how was I picking things up? Rather than picking up like this with my thumb, I was doing this number. And the thumb's relationship was diminished. So, when God, when we look at God and Him changing, intrinsically, God remains the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And the deepest part of the core of God is what? His holiness, His purity, His righteousness, His justice, His grace. All those characteristics of God remain the same. Extrinsically, does God change? Before God created the world, what was His extrinsic relationship with the world? Before He created it. What was his relationship? Was that a relationship? Was he the creator at that time? Was he the sustainer of the world before he created it? Come on now, don't be nervous. We're not going to record your test. When God did not create the world, and the world did not exist, there was no current relationship with God and the earth. It changed temporally, physically, that relationship changed. Why? Because before the creation, he was not the creator of this earth. Once the earth was created, he became the creator of this earth. And the two worked together for the sustenance of the world. Are you with me? So, the, ex, the, uh, the extrinsic change in God takes place to the extent that there is a temporal relationship with God. And that is related to our existence, but not the existence of God. Why? Why? Think back. Because on the continuum of time... The time of creation that was going to be in the future was already complete knowledge of God before He created it. Understand? We just proved that. That God is not contained by tensed time. He's beyond tense time. Therefore, from God's perspective, even before the earth was created, He had that relationship because he is not limited by time. Are you with me or did I lose lose anybody? It is therefore important for us to understand that our relationship with God may change. That our extrinsic relationship with God may change. But his is constant. There are teachers who will teach that God changes because of the change of relationship. But if we hold that God is not contained by the tense, and He has full and complete knowledge of the tense, then God before the earth was created, God already experienced creation. Before the earth was created, God already experienced you and me, and this day where we stand today. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that we worship. Who has a deeper relationship with us, and a complete relationship with us. We don't know ourselves the things that God knows about us. Do we know how many hair fell out of our head this morning or today? No. 
Oh, God does. Do we know how many skin cells died on us? No, we don't. God does. Why? Because he has complete knowledge. Complete knowledge. I'll take just a few minutes now to go back to the traditional discussion of God's omnipresence. Go with me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, we read that in our, for our scripture reading today. Psalm 139, I'm going to go just a little bit past what we read during our scripture reading time. As a little kid, I remember this being read by my mother many, many, many times in the Urdu language. And I would dare say that I could probably repeat it in Urdu. Because we heard it so many times. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for the darkness is as light to you. God is everywhere, everywhere. Go with me back to Jeremiah. We read Jeremiah before. Go back to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. Am I only a God nearby and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do not I fill the heaven and the earth? Declares the Lord. Fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dreams, but let, no, let the one who has my work speak faithfully for what has straw to do with grain. Can you forget? God doesn't forget. God is everywhere. No matter where we are, no matter where we go, go with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. This is Solomon. This is Solomon praising God after the temple was built. Saying to God that as beautiful as this temple is, this cannot contain you. No temple can contain you. Have you noticed? Oftentimes when we pray, we start our prayer with, Dear Father who art in heaven. I know Jesus started that way. But do you know that God is not contained anywhere? God is not contained in heaven. God is not contained on earth. God is not contained in a building. God is not contained anywhere. God is everywhere. I will have a study maybe next week where we compare the teachings of other faiths, other religions, as to who God is and where God abides. And only when we do a comparison will we understand who this God is and we will begin to understand God's demand that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. And we will begin to understand why the Bible says thou shalt make no graven images, no idols. In order to understand those concepts, we have to understand God's omnipresence and God's omniscience. May God grant 
that through the study of his word, we begin to recognize God deeper and closer day by day. And don't wait just for church. Go home and study the scriptures because this is where we meet God and learn about him. And this is where we get our salvation Amen. through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you all.